All right, we are ready to get started. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to start a little bit of review of what we did last week there in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, we're starting verse 19. Uh, as we get started, uh, let's go ahead and remember those who are sick and such. Remember Josh Phillips, that is Scott's uh, nephew, Scott Phillips' nephew. And uh, he is in serious condition. Uh, he uh, was born without a diaphragm. That's the, uh, I don't know if it's a muscle, I think it's a muscle that separates the lungs and the heart from the other organs. And uh, they thought he may be stillborn. And uh, he has struggled now, I think it's uh, two and a half months, but his heart's enlarged and uh, his tips of fingers and toes are turning blue and they think the end was nigh. So. Remember him, remember his family in your uh, prayers. It's uh, Kyle and Angie Phillips, that's Scott's brother, is Kyle. But remember them, they go to uh, Bryansburg. Also, on our other sick folks and such, let's see, who do we need to remember? Remember Jerry Scott? She's back at the, um, the rehab area over there. Oh, she got a virus? Probably so. She, okay. So she has a virus, so remember her, and she's better. Good. Okay. And she told me the other day she's hoping to go Metropolis, like, in the next little while. Yeah. So it'll be a while, but that's where she's hoping to go. She is, what, what's the name of the place? I'm still ignorant enough. Um... You know where you take exit 7, it takes you right past Lourdes, and you drive down to the road that takes you back to Baptist, that corner? Parkview? Okay. Yeah, that's the name of the place, isn't it? Parkview. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where she's going either. So, that's right. And she was so tickled, Randy, when y'all came by the other day with the kids. Oh, she was tickled about that. Yeah, she is tickled to see anybody. I think I've heard about that visit for two weeks. You made an impression. Like, those kids are so sweet. So that was good. All right, who else we need to remember? Who? Yeah, that's right. She had knee surgery. I saw her. She's in the hospital. That's right. Uh, no? Well, here-ish. Where is it she's at? Was that Paducah she had that knee surgery? Baptist Hospital. That's right. And did you have one? Scholar. Okay. Yeah, Scholar fractured his foot during a basketball game. Was that down in Florida that he broke it? Was it down in Florida where he broke it? Playing in a basketball game and broke his foot. He has a fracture in his foot. It's no good to have it happen during the season. That takes all the fun out of it. All right, let's go to God in prayer and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We're so thankful for this opportunity to be together, to uh, study your word. Father, we pray that you be with those who we have mentioned. We pray that you'll bless them. Father, we pray that you be with Josh. Help him to continue going on. Please uh, can give grace and mercy to his parents and his family at this time. Father, we're thankful that Jerry made it through her surgery well. We pray that she finishes up this virus. We're thankful that she's feeling better, and we pray that you'll bless her and comfort her. Father, pray that you'll be with Skylar as he recovers from his broken foot. Help him to recover soon so he can play some more. And Father, we pray also that you be with Miss Hoover and her knee replacement. We pray that you be with her as she grieves the passing of her husband. And Father, we're thankful for the life that she's lived. Father, we're so thankful for all the people here who are servants and all the people here who love one another and care for one another. We're thankful for your grace and for your mercy and the opportunity we have to be called your children. We pray that you be with us through our study. Help us to gain encouragement. Help us to gain courage by the things we learn. In the name of your Son, we pray, and amen. All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, and as we talked about last week, which our numbers are a little down last week in here, I think because of the cold weather. Uh, we talked about how 10 is the high point of the entire book. Uh, the writer has more or less gone through the whole book, getting us to this point. 
as he talked about in the opening, you know, God who at sundry times, various manners, spoke in times past to the Father, through the prophets, has in the last days spoken to us by his Son. In chapter 1, he talks about how Jesus is greater than the angels. Chapters 2 and 3, Jesus is greater than Moses. He talks about how Jesus is greater because he brings a better covenant, because he's a better high priest, because he's of the priesthood of Melchizedek. We go through all those things to get us to this point to show these folks why their struggle is worth it. Because that's what this book is about. This book is called Hebrews because it's written to the Hebrews. Those people who uh, ethnically were Jewish, they were Hebrew, but they've given themselves to Christ. And when you give yourself to Christ and you've lived in a world, it is a huge change. It is a huge um, culture shock. I was talking to a, uh, a missionary down in Columbia, Tennessee at Graymere. He's been a missionary off and on. He's now hired, I think, as an involvement minister and also as a liaison to uh, missionaries throughout the world. And we were talking back and forth, and he was talking about culture shock when he went down to, um, I think, it may have been Nigeria, it was somewhere in Central America. And he was talking about how people act different and everything else. And he said, you know, you go down there, and the first three months, it's just awesome because everybody's so different. And you think it's so quaint and funny. And you like trying the new foods and everything else. And he said after about three months, suddenly you hate the food. And you hate the people and you hate the language. You're just really tired of it. And he said then a little bit later, you get to where you accept the food and you accept the language. And he said, you know, you go through these changes as you go through. He said what you don't realize is when we bring somebody into the church... We have a culture here that people have to learn. Now, since we've always been immersed in it, we don't recognize the culture. But there is a culture that comes from somebody who leaves the world and comes here. For example, uh, yeah, we're old enough. Somebody says to you, 728B, what are they talking about? You ever heard 728B? What song is that? Yeah, Our God, He is Alive. Remember that song? There is Beyond the Average. Back when we used song books, 728B was the song, right? Okay. All right. Uh, the fourth Sunday, we're going to have a fellowship. What's that mean? Fellowship always means food. Now, in the Bible, fellowship doesn't mean food, but in the church, fellowship always means food. Okay. Those are some ideas or some ways in which there's culture here where a person who's never been a part of the church and they obey the gospel, they'll start hearing things and they'll think, well, that doesn't make sense or I don't understand that or whatever else it may be. They don't understand how we relate to one another, how we talk to one another. And that's why as Christians, we've got to be very concerned about people who obey the gospel and help them to stay faithful. They need to develop friendships. They need to develop relationships where people recognize if they're not there or whatever else. You'll notice in a congregation that actually, an occasional spouse, churches that actually convert folks, you'll end up losing a lot of the people who obey the gospel in a few months. And it's because of that, that hump of culture which is there. Well, these Hebrews had obeyed the gospel and now they're fighting the culture. Their family's saying, you know, you need to just come back. It was a lot easier when you hung out in the synagogue. And where they work, saying, you know, you're different now. I don't really feel comfortable with you. And now that you're enduring persecution, it'd be a whole lot easier to go back. So the writer of Hebrews has brought us to this point. Okay, look at verse 19. What's 19 start with? Therefore. And every time you see therefore, you've got to ask what question? What's it there for? All right, so let's see what he says. He's got a summary here. Therefore, here's a summary of everything that's been written before. Chapter 10, 1 through uh, 18 is the cliff notes of the beginning of the book, and this is a cliff notes of the cliff notes. Okay. Therefore, since we have boldness by the blood of Christ, since we have a great high priest who is in heaven, and since, we, since, since our sins are completely washed away, now, we talked about this last week, we had the vegetable sermon, Right? The old preachers used to have the vegetable sermon, and you'd go through three chapters. We'll just do chapter 10 of Hebrews. I'm not going to tell you all of them because I'll probably preach it someday. Now I'll pretend like I made it up. But this is the lettuce chapter, okay? 
Notice three times you have let us. Okay? Let us, verse 22, draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. First thing he says, verse 23, let us, okay? Have faith, heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, that would be repentance. Body sprinkled with pure water, that would be what? Baptism, bodies washed with pure water, excuse me, bodies washed with pure water. So the first thing you need to do, because of what God has done for us, because we have a high priest, because we have boldness to enter in that place, because of those things, the first thing you need to do is obey the gospel. That, in short, is the gospel right there. Have that faith, change your life, repentance, and baptism, okay? Obey. Verse 23, our other led us, okay? What do we do in verse 23? What is the next job for a Christian after obeying the gospel? Let us do what? Stay faithful, okay? Your job as a Christian after you obey is to not drop away, but continue to be faithful towards God. Your Christianity has to make a difference in your life. If you're not already, if you're not living the way you should, your Christianity didn't take right. You get what I'm saying? And so you have to stay faithful. Hold fast that confession with the, uh, with the hope that's in there. Okay? In verse 24, taking the selfishness out of religion, let us do what? Consider one another, stirring up love and good works. Okay? Exhorting one another so much more as you see that day approaching. Now, we love 24 and 25. We quote it all the time with church attendance. And that's okay. You're supposed to quote it with church attendance. What's the author going after here? When we get together, what is our job? When we get together as a church, what is our job? To exhort, to encourage, to stir up. Okay. You ever stir up critters? How about wasp? How you... Okay, you mess with his neck. Start messing with the nest, what's every one of those wasps going to do? Get active, buzzing, and they'll start chasing you around all over the place. I had an uncle, and I still haven't figured out how he did it. You know, he used to uh, build houses and such. He was always a whole lot more manly than me. But um, he used to just go up to a wasp nest and just grab it and squeeze it and throw it on the ground. Have you ever seen people do that? I saw somebody else do that the other day, and I was just like, you know, if I did that, my arm would be so swollen, I'd have to walk around like this all the time. But it was just amazing how they did that. We were, uh, I think we were looking at a house. This is last year, and there was a fence. It's about six foot or whatever. And um, he was wanting to get in the backyard, and the door was locked. And he said, well, just jump that fence. And I said, I'm not going to jump the fence. The fence was eight foot. And he jumped the fence. He's 83. I was like, well, Okay. Just got shown up. All right. Draw near, hold fast, stir up. The job of the church when we gather together is not just to glorify God. And yes, that is our highest point. He is the audience when we worship. But our job is to cheer one another up, to encourage one another, and to help one another. I think we do that pretty well at Benton. You see it happening in the foyer before church. You see it happening in the auditorium and up and down the hallways afterwards. You need to get in people's lives. You need to get to know who they are, what it is that makes them tick. And you need to do whatever you can to encourage every person that you see. That's the reason why people love coming to church. Not just to glorify God. And yes, that is the most important thing. But we gather together to stir one another up. If you leave here and you're not more um, enthused, and if you're not more excited about serving God, then we've done something wrong. That's what we're after. Okay, now verse 26, a scary passage, okay? If we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Okay? What's that verse mean? I'll have people bring this up to me every once in a while, and they are scared to death. What's it mean to sin willfully? What's he talking about there? Does that mean you make one sin 
it's all over for your time? Huh? Okay. Yeah, it's a continuing. It's a present active participle. Uh, we don't see that all that well. One of the problems with us leaving the King James, remember back when we were King James folks a generation ago, is you had that E-T-H, he that believeth and is baptized. That E-T-H oftentimes is a present active participle. It's a continuing action. And it will, we'll have this continuing action here as well. If you sin willfully, if you engage in sin and engage in rebellion, not just a one-time or two-time thing, but an action or a habit of sin, then there's not that sacrifice for you, but instead that fearful expectation. That's right. Absolutely. You're uh, crucifying Christ all over again. And let's go into that. That's in here in just a few verses. Verse 28, okay. How did you die under the law of Moses? The testimony of two or three witnesses. If you got two or three witnesses, they could stone you and put you to death. That's what it took in a trial. Okay? But verse 29, he says, look at these witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will, be, will he be thought worthy who has, first of all, trampled underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant by which he sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? In other words, when a Christian willfully turns away from the gospel... And when he makes it a habit of not doing what God would want him to do, even though he knows the truth, even though he has obeyed the truth, when he makes a habit of turning away, the writer of Hebrews says, first and foremost, he tramples the body of Christ. Christ was hung upon that cross because of our sin. And you're just walking to, you're trampling underfoot the blood. And number three, you're turning away from the spirit of grace. That's those three witnesses of which he's speaking. Now look at how serious this is. Verse 30. We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. All right. God is scary. And he's scary when you cross him. And especially when you cross him in open rebellion. Does anybody ever want to fight against God? The Pharaoh or the God of the Egyptians looked and said, Moses, you're a slave. You've got to recognize who's in charge here. Who ended up being in charge? God did, right? Okay. Goliath stood up and said, I'm great, you're small, you need to be my slave. Who is this little boy you send out? And David said, God will hand you over. Who won that battle? God did. And we go on and on and on all through Scripture, and every time we see God is undefeated. And so when you and I get it in our mind that we're going to beat God, that we're going to turn away from Him, and we're going to win a contest, guess what? God's going to remain undefeated. Is it possible for a person to be lost who once knew the truth? Absolutely it is in this passage. A lot of denominations, because they're Calvinistic background, Teach the impossibility of apostasy, or once saved, always saved. This passage goes pretty strongly against that false doctrine. It goes pretty strongly against those things. All right, why does the writer of Hebrews bring this up to them? What is it they're struggling with? Faithfulness. And the writer of Hebrews comes back pretty strong and says, listen, you leave, things are serious. You've got to recognize this is not some trite thing that you're leaving. It's not some simple thing which doesn't have consequences. You've got to recognize what you're turning against. You're turning against the covenant, against the body of Christ, and against the spirit of grace. But then he continues on a little bit more. Look in verse 32. But you, look back, recall those former days after you were illuminated, in other words, taught, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me, and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you do the will of God, you may receive the promise, and yet for a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. Okay, all right, they have gone through, verse 32, 
He says, remember those former days. Remember the good old days. Why you obeyed, what you're doing when you obeyed, when you're illuminated. That is, when they received the light, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Okay? That word's lesis. Okay? What word do we transliterate that into English? Athlesis. Athlete. Okay? All right. Athlete gets in a contest. What happens? They give everything they've got, especially when you go back to the Greek games. One of their favorite was wrestling. Their wrestling was much more serious than our wrestling's, a lot less rules. Can you have less rules in WWE? Oh, yes, you can. All right. All right. You watch uh, football players. You watch basketball players. Everything on this earth they can do to win, they're doing to win. All right? Okay, it's not cheating if you don't get caught. I don't know if you can say that in a church building. It's not cheating if you don't get caught. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Isn't that what they say? He's not saying cheat here, but he is saying you had a struggle. You recognize what you went through to get to this point. Okay? Get out of your comfort zone. Okay? You ever notice that you've got a man who works off his life to get money? And whether it's through his work, whether it's whatever it is, he gets money. And then oftentimes, this is a stereotype, it's not always true. His kids who grow up with that money, what do they end up doing with it? They spend it and it's all gone in a generation. It doesn't always happen, but a lot of times it will. Why is the man who earned it able to keep it when the people who didn't earn it aren't able to keep it? He knows how hard it is to get. He remembers the struggle that was there, okay? That's a little bit of what he's talking about, about this athlesis, about being an athlete. He said, you remember, look back to those former days and remember how hard it was for you to get here, how much work it took to get here and recognize what you just might throw away, okay? You look at the Lord's Church today. The people in the Lord's Church who are part of the progressive movement who are leaving the foundations of the church and turning the Lord's Church back into a a denomination, usually those... A lot of times people who are converted out of denominationalism will be hard and steadfast towards the precepts of the church because they recognize the difficulty, they recognize what they studied themselves out of in order to get to that point. But when people forget the struggle of getting there and people forget the difference between the Lord's Church and denomination, a lot of times they're a whole lot more willing to jump back right back into denominationalism because they don't see the difference, they don't see the struggle which is there that goes on. And that's what he's talking about, this great struggle with sufferings, okay? Verse 33, partly you're made a spectacle. Now that would be a... That would be one of those words which they would hang on when they saw it. We'll see this also in the book of Colossians. A spectacle was something which the Romans loved to do. Uh, The Romans made their money. The entire Roman economy worked off slavery. Every year, 200, well, uh, it it ranges depending on who you study. Anywhere from 750,000 to 2 million slaves were sold in Rome every single year. And that, is, that was the engine of the economy. You know, some people worked off tobacco, some people work off oil, some people work off cotton, you know, depending where you are. The economy in Rome worked off slavery. The soldiers would haul slaves back, bring them to Rome, they would be sold, and that's where the money was made, that's where the empire went. That's why when you study the book of Romans, you really look at the word slave, and you notice how often slave is used and the way in which it's used. That, that's a lot of what those Romans would be thinking about. Well, okay, you'd have a spectacle. What a spectacle would be is whenever a Roman emperor or the head of an army, which would probably soon be an emperor, whenever he would have a great battle, he would capture the head of the person which he was fighting, the, uh, the, uh, the leader. And they would put him in a cart, and they would roll him through the streets. Of course, you know, they'd have the, the uh, conqueror on the white horse. They'd have all the armies. They would have a lot of the different idols or whatever that these people would worship, things, you know, crazy animals that they might have, whatever else it might be different. And they would bring those things through, and then they would bring the spectacle. And the spectacle would be the man 
who was the leader or the general or whoever else it may be. And they'd bring them to the steps of the uh, great courthouse there and they would slowly torture him to death. Usually would strangle is what they would do. And they would try to kill him in the most embarrassing way possible. And that was a spectacle. It was something which everybody in Rome loved to see, showing how much greater their, their city was than any other city in the world. And so as a chance... You might see an ostrich for the first time in your life. You might see a zebra for the first time in your life. You know, different things which would come. And then you watch this person who thought he was so great die in an embarrassing way. That was a spectacle. Now, we see it two, no, I see it three times in the New Testament. He says, you were a spectacle. In other words, this world is holding you up as a Christian. And they're laughing at you because of what you're going through, because of how you're living, because of what you're giving up, and they're looking forward to every opportunity to make fun of you and to cause tribulations and troubles in your life. And he says, remember, you were made a spectacle by all those reproaches and tribulations, and if it didn't happen to you, it happened to your companions. Paul oftentimes was thrown in prison was beaten, was shipwrecked, all these things happened to him. He was made a spectacle, which we, is something he would talk about. And he would say, remember what's been paid for your soul. Remember what you've gone through. Remember how absolutely important it is that you are faithful to God. They had suffered great sufferings, public abuse, and seizure of their property as he goes through. Yes, absolutely. He was made a spectacle, wasn't he? Okay, going back to Philippians 2. He was made a spectacle. And so remembering Christ on the cross, you remember how he was shamed and how he was embarrassed. Okay? When it speaks of the ladies standing afar off, you know, Mary and Martha and all of them, they were afar off because of how embarrassing that would be. They were showing, um, they were showing compassion towards Jesus by not being at the foot of the cross. And so he was put in a very rough situation. That's a good point to bring out. And he says, so you see all those things in verse 34, but in spite of that, you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. All right. That verse 34 there is the strongest argument in the book of Hebrews that Paul wrote the letter. Because oftentimes Paul would talk about the times he spent in prison. Now, um, a lot of other people in the New, New Testament times, first century, got thrown in prison. I'm sure Apollos did. I know Luke did. Other people, which people will bring up. But this is the strongest argument that I don't really know. I'm not smart enough. He did. It's a possibility. But he goes through 32 through 34 saying, Remember the cost that you've paid. Remember what you've gone through. Remember what you've endured. And all those things. Now verse 35 Therefore, don't, which has great reward, don't throw it all away. Are there some times where people would just throw away their Christianity for something which is just dumb? Who we see in the old... ...oftentimes will be red stew. And I'll go to um, Walmart or wherever, and I'll buy a can of red lentils, you know, red bean about. He wanted those red lentils, okay? Now, red lentils, if you go to Walmart, will run you. It's rough. It's like 42 cents, okay? Is 42 cents worth giving up being the head of God's people? No. At least insist on a steak. And red beans, how dumb can you be to give up everything that you just gave up for red beans? Tips? Whether they're away from the cross, they're not. Sometimes it's an idea of trying to get... Is that new bass boat worth having? No, it's not worth having. Is that bigger house worth having? And we could go through and go through and talk about those things. Nothing, nothing is worth losing your soul. Esau screwed it. And we laugh at him. Huh? 30 of the uh, Son of God. Absolutely. And he says, so, you know, you need to have a that will come very soon. Okay? The one draws back, my soul has no pleasure. The just shall live by faith. It's found. You run into the Old Testament. There's a minor prophet named Habakkuk. Okay? The old country preacher told the church one day he's going to preach on Habakkuk. 
Not Tabakkuk, it's Habakkuk. And a prophet. Say that to God. Maybe we've said it ourselves. Pressing the poor, the rich, or you're just sitting back and letting it happen. And Habakkuk's angry with God. And God comes and says, well, don't worry, Habakkuk, about those things in the book. And these Babylonians are going to a small remnant, push, put fish hooks in their throats, and haul them all the way back to Babylon and make them slaves. Not the answer. Too holy to use to allow your people to who opens up. Habakkuk says, God, this can't be answered. You don't know what you're doing. I'm going to stand on this mountain until you come up with a decent answer for me. And God comes back, beginning of verse 2, I think, of chapter 2 in Habakkuk. And he says, Habakkuk, you need to write these things down on a big tablet. And you need to run back and forth. Write it big enough where when you're running, everybody to verse 4. The just man shall live by his faith. Trust in God, and God will take care of it. And he closes the book, and he says, hey, I'm going to trust in God. Even if everything in the world goes wrong, I'm going to trust in God. God always exactly what you'd want, is it? God, why you want the feet of a mountain goat? Goats can go up a mountain that steep. And Habakkuk says, I'm that way. With my faith in God, I can climb prophets much doing. Well, 16, for I'm not ashamed. And also to the Greek, now look at verse 17. Just as it is written, the just man shall live by his faith. Therefore, we have the end of the faith from faith to faith. Okay, that's verse 17. Key verse of the entire world's going on. You know, what, what's all this Israel? We don't understand all these things. The writer opens up and says, let me tell you about faith. Trust in people will take the book of Romans and they mess it up. Faith is not just belief, it's obedience. And so as you and I, Romans talks about obedience to the faith. Do you have to believe? Absolutely. But that faith will always bring forth obedience. It's saying, is it a faith or is it of words? Okay. Then you go back to the Galatians. Where they're saying, go back to the Judaism way. Go back to the old way. Galatians is a commentary of the book of Hebrews. And he will take care of you. 38. Bring over to chapter 10, 38. All right, these people are trying to bring you back. You trust God. You live by your faith. So you see how that minor prophet, New Testament, each time quoted in a totally... The just man shall live by his faith. Pleasure in you. Your life right now would be so much easier, simpler, if you would just give it all up and go back to the old way. Go back and have the Sabbath. Go back and follow those eating dietary regulations. Go back and be racist and look down on Gentiles. It would be so much easier. But I have confidence that you're going to be a person and you know God will see you through this. Most in your life and He will see through it. Oh, Absolutely. Right, right. That all the time. We live in a time, I don't know how much more time God's going to allow this to happen. The rich are oppressing the poor, right? Do we ever hear that politically? Uh, people are winning who shouldn't be winning. Do we ever hear that? Absolutely. God, where are you if all, this thing, all these things are going on? And like Ed Jones just said, that is what we hear a lot. We're reliving the book of Habakkuk. Just a three-chapter book. You're right. Very true. Very true. And the answer is, God knows, and God will take care of it. He's not going to answer it all the time the way we want him to answer it. But he knows, and he will take care of it. Okay, the just shall live by faith. Encouragement to endure the struggles of life which we have there. You see, Hebrews, boy, it speaks to today's world, doesn't it? speaks to today's life so very much. Because a lot of folks are struggling. A lot of people don't understand. And a lot of people are enduring a lot of things. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is stay faithful to God. God's plan is always today. Stay faithful even... Where the Hebrews... Uh, in some cases... Um, you run through the Hebrews, the Hebrews, the technical people with, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Jacob's name was changed to what? Legion, and they were known as the Israelites to about 586 B.C. The Jew is a, uh, the Jews. 
and there is some, some part of that. So refer to the God which they served. And uh, come back tonight.